this conference, as you know, it's two parts. One part will be in this uh, hotel, and the other section will be in Darjeeling University. And uh, I would like to thank the organization committee for this conference, especially Professor Kim Taehoon. And the, we will start this conference with the keynote speaker, Dr. Sabah Mohammed. I will go through his uh, uh, bio, or a short bio. Uh, professor Sabah he is a full professor uh, of computer science at Lakehead University, Canada, Ontario. And he is the chair of Smart and Connected Health with IEEE Comsoc. Also, Professor Mohammed, he is a supervisor of Smart Health Fab Lab, uh, a lab which uh, is established in Lakehead University and currently it's running inside the university with many graduate students. Uh, he is EIC of International Journal of Extreme Automation and Connectivity in Healthcare with IGI Global. So I would like to welcome Professor Mohammed, and uh, he has one hour to give his uh, keynote speak. So the applause is yours. Thank you. Thank you for uh, the introduction and thanks uh, to the conference who invited me to this lovely place and country and uh, I'm very proud and touched that I'm here with you and I hope that I will deliver a message uh, in my speech on a topic that I call <coughs> thick data. And thick data is uh, changing the, uh, the way we do analytics, so I hope that I will be a storyteller to you. So I'm not going to go uh, deeper in uh, uh, research uh, or theoretical uh, research. So this is some coordinate about me, and I'm sure Jinan did uh, introduce me well, so I do not need to talk much about myself. So. Let me start with uh, the obsession with big data. Uh, because big data uh, uh, was the hype actually during the last five years. Everybody says uh, to be competitive, you need to understand data. You need to understand consumer insights. So without understanding consumer insights, I cannot become a successful business person or institution or whatever. So data analytics and big data become a, a very big hype. Everybody wanted, everybody, a big investment. So that was the, the, the hype of, of uh, the last five years. Let me go and proceed. Uh, I want to say one thing. Uh, why we are so much obsessed with big data? Because humans naturally uh, obsessed with numbers. Anything quantitative is so much attached to our nature. We count, we classify, so everything is about counting. So uh, that is in our nature. So big data became became the, the obsession because of, of our nature that we are, we love numbers. Humans love numbers. And always they say, number says everything. If you have those quantities, you can quantify, then you can identify things. So, uh, actually, big data bring, bring what we call a, a, a tsunami of of data, huge data. We are collecting everything. Uh, every movement, every gesture about consumer, what they buy, what, what they select. What, uh, so we, we have huge number of silos of data. And everybody says, if you are clever, you can go into this data, analyze it, and bring the golden hammer, what we need to target. 
So that was the promise of big data uh, during the last five years. What happens that big data put a lot of big claims. Uh, you know, those people who adore big data or what we call them cheerleaders, cheer uh, they said, well, uh, data analytics or big data will, will remove the uncertainty. It will make everything certain. It will give you perfect numbers, what you need to do exactly. And they tell you that every single data point can capture, uh, or you capture, will, will give you a lead what to do next, what you, ta you need to target. The promise is that uh, now, uh, or, or, or what, what they said about big data, that uh, with enough data, Numbers will say everything, will tell you everything. Numbers will speak for itself, or thyself. Okay, that's the promise, that if you have the data, you can analyze it, you will get a lot of perfect predictions, no confusion. That's the promise of, of uh, what big data people will say. But reality says differently. 92% of business people still very much uh, very scared of from going into big data. That's number one. The eight percent who went into get big data, their project failed. And this is not me who is saying this. You see, if you go to Gartner, okay, and I know, uh, I, I'm, I'm not too sure that you know uh, uh, Gardner Analytics, it's the big institution who monitor technology in the whole world. So uh, the guys in Gardner, they say, is, well, 85% of big data projects fail. And when they ask CEOs, they said, well, what about the remaining 15%? How much will succeed? CEO says, well, it seems only 45% will succeed from those remaining 50, uh, or 43% actually from the remaining will succeed. So, so numbers on big data success is very little. We invested a lot, but we got little. Let me go one, one step more. How much did we invest, it, for example, in 2019, according to IDC, which is the most uh, notable uh, institution that tell you how much investment in this technology, big data? They said, we, we invested $187 billion on big data projects, but what we get, very little. Very little. So, actually, 187 billion dollar was wasted, almost. Uh, let me go further. So, the dilemma is as follows: uh, Do we trust numbers, or do we trust experience? Which one is more important? You see. Nowadays, for example, in Northern America, they said, well, even you have very smart CEOs, better to trust numbers, not those CEOs with vast experience. So, uh, even some CEOs were, were tempted never to say anything from their experience when numbers say something else. So, so there is a dilemma now. Do we trust numbers or do we trust experience? Which one is the right one? Let me go further. And let me say one thing. This is, uh, I, I don't know if you know this uh, a, a smart a young lady, okay? Teresa Wang. Uh, she was working for Nokia. 
of course, Nokia at, at that time, okay, 2009, uh, was one of the giant companies uh, who dominate mobile technology. Uh, Teresa uh, was asked by Nokia, go and do kind of survey. What consumers in China want? And, and she came back with, with a report saying, oh, I found something very interesting that in China, people, yes, they prefer cheap, uh, cheap phones, cheap smartphones, but they, they always like to go for a smarter one, even if they cannot afford it. They go and work harder to bring a phone better than a cheap one. She relayed that, that report to Nokia telling them, invest in high smartphone, not a cheap smartphone. Look what happens to a report, okay? <clears throat> so, this is Teresa Wang, and if you are interested, okay, uh, please look at her TED talk. She talked very nicely, and she tell you her experience. She's a big CEO now in, in America, okay? That talk of Teresa is very important because she opened the eye of every entrepreneurship in a, a company, institution, to change direction from big data to something that now I'm going to declare the thick data. So I will, I will be very clear in a few slides. So this is Teresa Wang, and uh, Teresa Wang, uh, when she uh, 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 reported her uh, finding uh, in, uh, from the work in China to Nokia, Nokia was saying, no, uh, what you brought are very small numbers. She, uh, Teresa did collect only 100 person interviews. They told her, the data you brought is only from 100 person, but the data that we have is 100 million. What you are talking about? Your sample is nothing. I cannot rely on your finding because you didn't have a representative sample. So they neglected the report. Uh, so, the question is as follows. Do you think that what is measurable is valuable? Now we understand it is not. Because data analytics studies have been done by Nokia says that the trend is to go and manufacture more cheap phones. And Teresa was saying, no, we want the smarter phones, not cheap phones. Uh, and now you can understand that measurable data does not mean they are valuable. Because they, they let actually a big company like Nokia to go down. Uh, now, if you look at the statistics, uh, this is where uh, the Sambian, okay, which is Nokia, uh, sales went down, 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 and, and then uh, it vanished in 2011. So from 2009, where Teresa uh, reported the report, till 2011, other competitive uh, produce more smartphones and less cheap phones while Nokia continued producing uh, cheap phones and then they went down. This is not what the consumer want. Although the big data that Nokia collected says well produced, they are very happy with, with, cheap, phone, with, with cheap phone. It's not right. It's not right. Sometimes 
small samples are more valuable than bigger samples, especially if the data is not quantitative, qualitative. Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll differentiate that in a few slides. So now, now we know there's a problem with, with big data. Uh, big data do not give the whole image. So that question being raised to big scholar, what shall we do? If big data cannot pinpoint consumer insights, what shall I do? So they came with solutions. I call them patching solutions. They said, well, well, we can we need to use different type of analytics like consumer segmentation analytics, compute, uh, consumer engagement analytics, consumer ch uh, charm analytics, uh, consumer acquisition analytics, and so forth. More deep learning and so forth. So they, they put lots of patching solutions here, here, here. Oh, that would solve this side of this defect of big data. This will remedy the, this part that all those patching techniques didn't, didn't even fly so high. Let me go higher and draw a bigger image. So what we need? Actually, we need a kind of analytics to go deeper and find hidden patterns, OK? But if you ask, what is the hidden patterns in data? that big data couldn't find it, OK? Well, uh, the, the answer is as follows. I want to know the feeling, the story of the consumer. To feel the story of consumer that may not only the good things, the bad things too. What is bad? Why, why, why the consumer do not want that product? And the answer is as follows. If I rely on big data, only 4%, only 4% of consumers re report that they are unsatisfied with, with certain products. So if I rely on big data, big data always rely on, on whatever they collect. Consumers provide only 4% of complaints. You see, they, they keep the complaints in their heart. They do not write it. They do not complain to the company. But they complain among themselves. So, so if I rely on automatic collection of data, very few complaints I, I do have. Then I would say, well, everybody is happy with my product. So that's a, a wrong direction. So we need to go deeper and find those hidden patterns that represent consumer insights. OK, that's a, a part of the story. And so we need a, a new kind of analytics that go and, and try to get those hidden patterns from consumer. OK, that need to have different techniques. OK, let me, let me go a little bit. Uh, and understand how, how can I design an analytics that go to the consumer and produce those hidden patterns, although consumers do not like to report. OK. So, uh, so I would say the solution was to use something we call thick data. What is thick data? Thick data is to understand the quarks of human behavior and predict how individual relationship with business uh, service or product will evolve over time. Okay, so thick data will go and pull those insights from consumers by certain techniques. I will talk about those techniques. Okay. Those techniques are not quantitative. They are qualitative. That means I have to invent techniques where I go and let the consumer to talk. Maybe interviews, maybe other techniques. 
I will talk about how many techniques that I can inject for uh, thick data. So they are qualitative, but I want you to understand that they are not quantities, they are not numbers. They are, they are a certain uh, feedback provided by the consumer, where we can give them through certain techniques. OK, let me give you a story, OK, uh, before I proceed on big data. Uh, look, I will take Samsung as, a, as a, an example, OK? And I'll tell you, well, uh, in, 2000, in 2013, Samsung reported that they sell smartphones uh, more than Apple, more than the iPhone, something like uh, 35 million uh, more smartphones than Apple in that year. Hmm. You say, well, this is a little bit uh, uh, different. Uh, but let me, let me ask you this question. Do you think that consumers will buy a smartphone just because they hear, they hear that number? That uh, people are buying more smartphones from Samsung? And then everybody will go and buy. And you will tell me no. No, I will not buy a, a cell phone because I have the numbers or people are going to buy from Samsung more. That is not the factor. The quantity is not the factor. Although you hear it, uh, people do not act according to numbers. Consumers have a different insights. But what they are, okay? So if you look carefully, they look into factors like this, okay? Uh, they have certain preferences. I look into performance of the device. Maybe performance is very important for me. So I can compare when I buy. I look into, for example, something like battery life, and then compare. So people have that comparative uh, uh, point of view. I look into other things like style. For example, Samsung was so successful because their interaction style is so nice. So they, uh, uh, most of the people go with Samsung just because of certain features. Certain features like design. And that's what, what consum consumers look at. They do not look at numbers. They look at certain identifying features, and those are the hidden factors that I was talking about. Okay, so of course, uh, vendors do have wars. iPhone with, uh, with uh, well, with, with other uh, manufacturers like Samsung, with others, so we, we understand this one. Let me give you a, a, another uh, case study, okay? You know the Lego? Lots of firms, uh, Young people play with those Lego. Uh, Lego uh, company was uh, almost bankrupted in 2000, uh, year 2000. In that year, they came to the CEO, all the directors, and they said, well, we are losing so much. We are losing a lot. We need to close the business. That's, it. That's our final decision. Let us close the business. So, actually, uh, we went before uh, me and Dr. Fiali to the, the manufacturer because we want to understand, actually, they, uh, it was so interesting uh, to, to be among uh, the Lego company uh, recently in Amsterdam. And they told us a story. This is the story, believe me. Uh, that uh, director general, okay, of uh, the CEO of the company, says, well, when the directors came to me in 2000 and said, well, we need to shut the business because nobody is interested anymore in, in Lego games. And, of course, the director general asked them, did you try everything? They said, well, everything. We added to the Lego action figures. 
we are we added lots of things that is can be with some animation i press this so so the game or or the the the, the the play will become more interesting. They try everything. So they said, well, we failed. There is no interest in our business. You know, this CEO says, your number must be wrong. He was so brave, actually. He said, let us give our product and our company two weeks more. And they told him, what you will do in two, two, two weeks more? There is no feedback. He said, give me the trust, let us resist two weeks more. We are losing, but I want those two weeks. And in those two weeks, he sent five groups to schools. He tell, he tell them, go and uh, uh, take your products to those schools. And I want a, a complete video to be recorded on, on those groups. They gave all what they, their product they have to kids. Play. And what they found, that kids play with not everything. They, they play with the classic Lego. They do not like the action figures, they do not like the other lines of, of products that they put, but they like those, those uh, classic uh, figures. So, This is a, a kind of a, a workshop, okay? Because the CEO asked that if they, if, if kids like those classic things, let us let us see. The video shows classic Lego is more interesting. Let us continue that time. So they tested in several places, like Beijing and other uh, places. And they find their finding is really true. What happens? He asks them to stop producing any new line and focus only on the classic Lego. And from then, from 2000 up to now, now it, the Lego is very profitable. Uh, the direction of Luz changed because we have a different insight, not numbers, but something we call uh, a qualitative uh, knowledge. We got some qualitative knowledge from interaction with those uh, kids and groups. So this is a second example to show you that qualitative data is valuable. Not quantitative could, could, could give you, uh, or a quantitative analysis could give you uh, some kind of surface inside that they do not go deep. So not every measurable thing is valuable. So what is valuable, you can know it only via uh, 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 what, what we call qualitative analytics. Look, I can go and give you lots of similar stories because now when other vendors, big giants, started to learn Ah, the, the issue is not big data. The issue is that I need some kind of qualitative data that goes deep inside the mind and stories of every consumer. That's how I, I need. Believe me, if I tell you how, how companies like GM, okay, where they uh, reinvented themselves, companies like uh, uh, even now Google, okay, or or if I go to Netflix, okay, I don't know if Netflix is here, okay, uh, but Netflix, for example, they reinvented themselves. They were started to lose interest, although they have every movie. What they found through a very small sample, that uh, uh, whoever uh, look at their uh, movies, they are not interested in so many movies, they are interested in certain series. So the feedback came to uh, this vendor, focus on series. People are liking series. So now Netflix is giving more on, on series more than... Okay. Uh, this is 
if I give that uh, question to scholars, they will come with a lot of uh, uh, different techniques, okay? Oh, go and do something like social advertising, do, do something like this, do that. They, they will give you uh, a flora of techniques that you need to do in order to go and find some kind of hidden uh, papers. Okay. But most of the techniques that you see is kind of classical techniques that have been tried before. Uh, so they tell you, of course, at the end, this is what, uh, what is called consumer journey analytics. Okay. Look, I work in healthcare, and when I ask myself what uh, thick data mean, uh, what kind of technique that I need to use and find those qualitative uh, analytics in healthcare, I will come with something like this. Oh, uh, create focus groups and, and see the, what, what kind of uh, discussions in those focus groups. Uh, do something like blog comments, okay? Let, let your patients uh, write about their experience, blogs. Uh, uh, read their, your consumer reviews and complaints. Uh, use Google Trends, use question and answer sites. Use Google Analytics, use Twitter Insider, use and they give you lots of other sites like Patient Like Me, Drags.com, and so forth. Uh, <coughs> and lots of data collected by FDA, okay? Oh, yeah, those are what I call uh, legacy techniques to bring qualitative data. But, but those are uh, Those are, uh, again, kind of legacy techniques that are scattered. You see, if somebody gave me, oh, do interviews, do that, do that. Yes, yes, they will give you a lot of qualitative data, but they do not uh, uh, act as a unified technique. So I need one unified technique that go deeper and find those uh, insights in a better way. So I ask myself in that direction. Okay, how do I have, how can I have a, a, an integrated technique, kind of technique that I rely on, uh, instead of having that flora of, of techniques that they might take me and provide me the story of uh, the consumer journey. Okay, the focus that I, 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 I found that the best thing is to focus on conversations. Uh, if I can identify conversations with, with consumers and learn the outcome of those conversations, then I can find what the consumer think. Okay, so, let, uh, so the recommendation was to look into uh, the conversations, understand conversations and interactions. Okay, if I want to understand conversation and interactions, okay, I need a media. Let me test this idea. Okay, so I, I need a media for conversation. If I look at the media of conversation, I will look into that something like this. Oh, Twitter, one of the media, that everybody talk to everybody. I talk to my friends, I talk to the experts, I talk to my medical doctor, I talk to uh, and a manufacturer, and everybody talk to everybody. Everybody is, com is doing kind of communication, conversation with, with other people. So that is a very good media. Let me test this idea, okay? And let me see how can I uh, class uh, classify conversations and learn from conversations. Okay. So I will, uh, of course everybody know that one, okay? When you look at Twitter, uh, you will you'll see that uh, you, can, you can tweet people, 
you can retweet, uh, you retweet people, you can follow people, uh, let you, uh, uh, people follow you, you can hashtag things, you can uh, 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 provide links to certain uh, sources, you can use certain sources and so forth. You can see all these uh, links produces kind of conversation graph. Uh, if I follow only uh, who tweet who, who reply to who, uh, who hashtag what, uh, then I can write or I can find uh, uh, lots of what we call a community graphs. Graphs where people are talking uh, uh, based on uh, certain structure. For example, retweets or replies. Uh, will represent certain graph. If I if uh, if I want people to talk about topic, maybe I will follow only hashtags and things like this. So then I will have a different uh, kind of community graphs. Okay. You see, because I focus on healthcare, so conversation in in healthcare is very important. So these are kind of conversations that you will find. I talk to a manufacturer like Johnson & Johnson and say, well, this product is uh, having certain adverse events. And the manufacturers might reply to me, well, uh -huh, what, what kind of adverse uh, uh, Why you do not phone us? Let us talk. Uh, or uh, uh, tell me why. So uh, having this conversation is very important. Look, this question was raised even by FDA. You know, FDA is uh, the institution in the United States that give uh, the right uh, to use certain drugs. So unless the uh, drug or a medicine is approved by FDA, it will never be in the market. So FDA raised this question. Uh, he gave an institution saying, well, everybody says, well, uh, you, you know, side effects, for example, uh, in FDA is measured by a system called uh, Farias. And in that system, doctors, pharmacists, uh, whoever work in healthcare, they can report. I have a patient who have an adverse event. When you give them penicillin, they have a rash. So they report it. So everything is reported with any adverse event. But what they found that people talk about adverse event that is not reported in the various system. So FDA says, well, why not they give one big company, let them study the adverse event reported by our system, okay? Mm -hmm. that seems to need to recharge it. Okay. So, uh, yeah. I need to recharge that one. Okay. Uh, so when they compare the adverse event reported in their system, and the other person even reported on, on Twitter, they find lots of similarity. The pattern is almost similar. And they said, of course, they, they took very large sample from Twitter. Uh, for example, uh, they find people who talk about Humera, one of the medicines, That, uh, that those adverse events that are reported in various, it's reported in, on, on uh, Twitter, but even more. Some more adverse events, actually 13% that is not reported on various, it's reported on Twitter. When they test some, some of those adverse events, are they realistic? They find it yes. Yes, so there are adverse events that I cannot find it through various system. So, they said, well, it worked. They, they, they wrote a, 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 a mechanism, a procedure to use blog like Twitter, okay, 
to collect as well simple. Now it's it's more reliable to them. I don't want to go into the comparison because it needs a lot of talk about it. Uh, uh, how they prove this is, uh, uh, but here's here's the dilemma. Where is the qualitative analysis here? Okay, you use a conversation uh, uh, media like Twitter, but I didn't see yet anything qualitative. It's all quantitative. Ah, that's right. If I look at Credible uh, uh, research, okay. They said uh, I cannot rely on Twitter because lots of things on Twitter are not realistic. Uh, and the reason, if you look at it carefully, is because of one thing because they use very bad. A quantitative model, okay? Because what they do, they collect tweets, they put them in a silo, okay? That model is called back and forwards. You collect tweets, you put them in a silo, and measure things. Those tweets are not related to each other. Maybe they are related to the topic. I go and find something about Homera. And I bring all the tweets there. Maybe 100 million tweets. And put it in a silo. And then study something. But, but they are not related. Uh, and could be in a different timeline even. Uh, different patient groups. Uh, nothing, nothing there. Uh, sometimes you complain about something. I, I, I might ask my doctor in a, uh, on my Facebook or my Twitter and say, well, look, you gave me uh, this medicine, but I feel very dizzy. Uh, is that from the medicine? And my doctor will say, well, no, because, uh, uh, because uh, uh, this medicine required to be taken be before, before you stay. And you, you took it at the day time. That's why you are busy. And then the patient will say, Oh, I see, I didn't realize that I have to take it at the bedtime. What do you think? Although the patient complained about uh, an adverse event, nausea, an adverse event, or dizziness,